to give. And, and today, yes, we're talking about money. And we've been talking about it for a couple weeks. I got one more sermon to go. And next week, you do not want to miss it. Because if you do, I'm coming to see you. My whole thing in this whole concept is I don't always believe that people know what to do with money. We live in a country today where inflation is going from 21 to 31. It depends on the percentage of stuff going up. And I'm concerned about that, how we look at money. Credit card debt is off the roof, and churches are struggling to stay open and to maintain. And this church is no different than any other church. Without money, the church can't function. Without money, the church can't spread the gospel. But we can do both. We can adjust what we did as we did in this church. Our budget year starts September 1, goes through August 31. And we cut our budget to adjust for what we think is going to happen in the fall of the year and possible in the spring, possible recession. And so the leadership of this church is trying to do the things that God has taught us in Scripture. And so the whole thing is we've got to know the attitude of God has about money. We need to make sure that we have the right attitude. No matter how much you've got, how little that you have, it does not matter. In 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 7, it says these words, and the Bible, this is God's word. It is his breath, and there's no errors in this. And he knew we would have a struggle at some point in our life to deal with money, about giving money to the church. So here's what the word says. Paul writes it this way. He says, you must decide what's in your heart. And how much to give. You have to decide. I can sit and tell you and show you scripture where you ought to do this percentage and that percentage. But that doesn't matter. Until you decide in your heart what you're going to do. He says don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. I'm not ever going to pressure you. I'm not going to give you the guilt trip 101, 102. I know how but I don't believe it that way. So God wants and blesses a cheerful giver. We need to understand the attitude that God wants us to have. It starts with the heart. So I want you to take your hand and cover your heart just for a second. Makes you want to stand up and do the Pledge of Allegiance, don't it? So what happens, well, you have a heart. So ask your neighbor now, just turn to your neighbor and say, what's in your heart? So now ask them, what's in your wallet? So the heart issue, so what happened, everything starts in the heart, the willingness and the whole nine bit. And so what it tells us that you and I need to have the right attitude about this. And what I'm trying to teach in this sermon is this. Until you get the right attitude, until you put God number one, you're not going to get there. God has to be first in your life. I've learned as I teach people all the time. My friend Chandler is not here this morning. I'm going to be doing their wedding pretty soon. And Chandler is one of those City of Rock Hill employees that's been working since 5.30 a.m. has not went home yet. We're going to be praying for those folks in just in a few moments. And I told him, I said, God has to be first. And then as I was telling this young couple who I'm going to marry, God's got to be first. Spouse has to be second. Your children have to be third. Your job has to be fourth. Your extended family has to be fifth. And you don't even make the top five. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not even in the top five. <laughs> I was going to tell you to tell me, you ain't nothing. But, that, but what happens in this is that God is asking us to have the attitude of a Christian. And he wants us to be people that give. And what I learned is that what that translates into is action. See, when this, last night as Anita texted me and told me and she said, we, we had this opportunity, and there's a window. The window's only open about that much, and we got to seize the opportunity. And so for we will go do this, and she asked you, just go buy one thing. Just, just get one thing and, and, and bring it, and with a cheerful heart. Because I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of people helping. But we as a church right now are talking about giving. This, you don't take this money and buy this out of your tithe. You buy this money out of your offering. You pay your tithe and the offering. That's what you do. And when you do that, God blesses you. I'm telling you, some people have bought into this mess from these pink-haired people on TV. You don't give 100 to get 10,000. That is not how that works. 
See, God blesses us in multiple ways. God blessed me last week for a church that would listen to a guy who was swelling up, looked like he was going to blow up like a balloon. But you know what? God works. And he wants us. He, he wants us to make sure we seek him first. Matthew 6, one of my favorite verses of all the time, it says, seek the kingdom of God. If you read from the King James Version, seek first the kingdom of God, and all else will come to your way. He tells us the attitude of our lives about anything determines what's going to happen. So if we have the right attitude about money, things will go right. I like to be around positive people. I do not like to be with negative people. That's why I love when Clemson wins, so I can be around positive people. When we lose, we ain't happy. So I'm just saying that to you. Did you not know that God has talked, Jesus talks more about money? In 38 parables or so, he talks 50% of those parables are about money. It's even more than heaven and hell. Why? Because he knew you'd have problems with it. And he wants us to know how to do it. He wants us to have the right attitude and the right influence with money. The bottom line is, if you don't know how to manage your money, it'll manage you. And every one of you know that. The number one problem in South Carolina in divorces is money, the pressure of money. We have a new motto among married couples, until debt do we part. And so what happens to us is the economist teaches us that fears will happen as long as we don't put things in the right place. So I'd like you to take your Bible, turn it to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. I want to read you a parable. It's kind of a weird parable to me. Because normally when you read a parable, it's normally about Christ is the good guy and there's the wicked people. But this parable really is just about wicked people. And what happens is this is what will happen to you if you don't learn how to have the right attitude, do the right things that God teaches us about the money. And he says this, Jesus told a story to his disciples. His disciples are there. There are other followers there. There are Pharisees and the Sadducees and there ain't those seeds there. And there was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. Now, I don't know what it was he was wasting it on, but he was wasting that money. It could have been by, he could have been eating in better restaurants. And, well, I was going to say and instead of eating at Bojangles, sorry. McDonald's was where I went this morning. So what Jaime says to him, you're wasting my money. So the employer called in, and he said, and basically what the manager's saying here, one day he reported, and he said, you're fired. That's exactly what this comes down to. When we do wrong, we lose our job. He says, I'm going to fire you. So what happens, this guy, he invites everybody that owes the man who just fired him to his place and says, let's talk about this. Now, watch this. He knows he's in trouble. He's trying to find a way to get through this, and so he invites everybody. So he's one guy, he says, uh, Joe, let, just stay with me. Let me have some fun here, okay? I didn't get to preach last week, so let me have some fun. So he says, Joe, how, how much you owe? He said, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. He said, uh, take out the bill and change it to 400 gallons. Now, where I come from, that's how that sometimes the United States government acts. And just keep spending and spending and spending, spending and, and then doctor the books. It's been happening for a long time. And then he says to the next guy, how much do you owe us in wheat? He said, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat. He said, turn that over to 800 bushels. Now, where I come from here, in, I grew up in Indian land where there, was, there wasn't no traffic lights and stoplights, two-lane roads. That's called cheating. That's called stealing. That's called cooking the books. And this is where you say what? Amen. So what happens in this, the whole thing is, is that they're, they're, they're trying to cook the books so it won't look so bad. We can't cook the books. When we do stuff, it has consequences and it works. So it says at the end of that, the rich man, he kind of admired his dishonest loyalty person, but he still was a rascal, and the NLT says it that way. And at the end, he says, it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than they are the children of light. See, the attitude toward money is that I can just, I can rationalize my sin, I can cheat people, and it's okay. That is not of God. That is not how this does. 
think about the people sitting there. There's the Pharisees who like to stand in the corner and brag about how much they gave. And then there's people over here that are sitting here, have, they're, they're trying to rationalize, I'm glad I'm not like that person over there. And he is saying to us this, that Jesus is teaching his disciples, we can't be like that. The Pharisees are self-righteous, they're judgmental, they're legalistic, and they love money. The Bible says in Luke 16, 14, the Pharisees made fun of Jesus because they dearly love their money. Jesus often, as you go through this, Jesus gives them the shockwave and begins to tell the story. And in this whole idea, as we begin to read this thing, we begin to see some things here this morning. That, yes, you can look at this guy. Yes, he is aware of what's going on. Yes, he's intelligent and he's resourceful, but he's still a thief. And he's still lying and he's still cheating. And the Bible often asks us, are we a person who's going to rob God? No, we can't be a part of that. I've noticed in this parable that is, there's two parts. There's the parable, and then there's the application. And, and every bit of this is that we don't need to be like the Pharisees. We don't need to have a love for money. We need money. My, my father would say, um, I'd say, well, you know, money is not everything. He would cross his arms every time. He'd say, yeah, but you got to have it to stay here. And that's a true statement. And that's why we have to be good stewards of money. But we have to. To have the right attitude giving our money to the Lord. All of this parable is to benefit you, to motivate you to do right. The thing that I have stressed in this series is not so much about money, it's about obedience. This unorthodox setting is really teaching us that the world does not know what to do with money. In this whole thing, he's saying that there are wicked people who are always trying to scam. You know how I know? Because your phone is like mine. Mine rings. Potential spam. Now they've gone to a new trick. They'll have a name on it. Yeah. So I answered the phone the other day. And, and I, I made a mistake. Won't happen again. I answered the phone. And I said, hello. And the lady said, is this, this, is this John Barry Yates? Now they immediately, if someone calls me John, I know they do not know me. And I said, y y yes, ma'am. And she said, do you know how much you owe? <laughs> I said, um, ma'am, let me sing a song for you. And she said, what? I owe, I owe, and off to work I go. <clears throat> well, I hung up. I was trying to be nice, but she wouldn't quit talking, so I just hung her up. I, it wasn't my fault. She kept talking. I told her I had to go. And, and so what we learn from this is, is that we've got to be people that understand we're different than the world. See, unbelievers are wise in things of the world, but believers are wise of what Jesus wants us to do. We don't need to be like this little rascal who's trying to steal all the money, trying to cook the books. We need to be people who are doing what's right and trying to be good before the Lord. Jesus wanted his followers to realize that we need to do always what is right. Our wealth is to be helping other people to find Jesus. He teaches us that we need to be people that are always trying to help us. I've learned in this story that you can't serve two masters. You can't serve money and God at the same time. You can't. You know, I, when I was a kid growing up, I don't know how many of you, but I went to church every time doors opened. Every time doors opened, we took up an offering. And our church that I grew up in, they loved George Washington. He was their favorite president. He said, how do you know that? Because that's the one they put in the offering plate. We knew that. And so what I'm saying to us is that we need to be conscious. So I want to teach you what the Bible teaches in this story about the attitude toward money. I want to show you as a Christian this morning how we need to preserve this and look at this. Here's the first thing. What I think I own is really on loan. It's not yours. It's really not your money. It's on loan. I don't know about you, but I don't own really anything. I don't. You, you, everything you have is from God, and you can't take it with you. No funeral that I've ever done had a, 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 a whole U-Haul behind it trying to take it all. It doesn't work that way. But everything in your life, including your heartbeat, 
is on loan from God. And we need to be people that realize he blesses us. So let me show you something. Think about it this way. Just think about it. God gave you your health, and he wants you to manage your health. He, he gave you freedom, and he wants you to manage that freedom. God gave you a mind, and he wants you to wisely manage your mind. He's given you time, and you're to manage your time wisely. He's given you talents that you're to use wisely. He's given you the money, same concept. He wants you to use it wisely. So think about this way. What you have is not really yours. It's a loan from God. And he's loaning that to you, and I'd like to say it this way, with no interest. But he also is holding you responsible for what you spend. He said, what do I do? Next week, I'm going to try to help you in this. Uh, I, 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 it applies to me, too, so don't think you're, I'm above me because I'm right, above, right there with you. But we need to understand that everything we have is on loan from God. The second thing I want you to discover is this. One day, I will give an account to God. In Luke 16, 2, it says, the employer called him in and says, what is this I've heard about you? Get your reports in order because you're, you're going to be fired. Well, I say to you, my friends, every one of you that are sitting within the sound of my voice or watching us by live stream, every one of us, the Bible says, we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to give an account one day. Yes, I know that Jesus died on the cross, and I know that he gave me, forgave me my past, present, and future sins. But what I want you to understand, he's going to do it all in our life. And in that, he's going to ask you one question that you need to make sure you understand this morning. He's going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? Key question in this whole giving. He gave you talents, and he gave you money, he gave you freedom, he gave you relationships. He, he put you in a network, he gave you intelligence, and you're going to give an account for that. And, and what happens is that we, at that moment, are not going to have the opportunity that this guy did to come up with another plan. Listen to me. As followers of Jesus Christ, there's only one plan. Follow Jesus Christ. There is no B. That is the A plan. That is the only plan you have is to follow Jesus and point people to him. So what I learned to do is that I need to understand that evil is always lurking around us to take what we have. Evil is always going to be around you. And you need to understand when you meet somebody, and there, especially as we're starting to move to the holidays, we're already experiencing here in church, people needing help. And we want to help people. There's only so much we can do. And I know sometimes I get out at Walmart or some other restaurant or some place, and they, people will come back and say, could you help me? I don't always care a lot, but I always try to carry some in my pocket. I give them what I have. I've had people say, oh, they're just going to go down and get something, some alcohol with it. Not my problem. It's not my problem. He said, you, you don't want to, no, I'm not in control of that. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is going to draw them, but it's not my problem. My job is the Holy Spirit moves me to give. It's just like this afternoon. You're going to have to change what you're doing. I know some of you are going to go to lunch, and I want you to go to lunch, eat your food real fast like I do. Don't get no reactions, come back. But I want you to go get one thing. Let this church be a church who's going to give an account when we stand before the Lord. And we said, well, what did you do that Sunday morning that Pastor Barry preached at? I didn't do nothing. I went, I went and ate. Did you take something back? No, I, I didn't. And you said, well, that's guilty. No, I am not guilty. I'm laying it out that God is giving this church an opportunity to do something this morning. I want to be a part of that. Hey, listen, that's why I hang out here so much. I'm scared God's going to do something, and I'm going to miss it. So if you just live here, you don't miss it. So here's what I want you to do. Number three, to manage your money wisely, I must look ahead. That verse, in th now what? You've got to look down the road. That's why your leadership of this church made sure that we're trying to get ready for the economy to make a turn. If it goes down, we're prepared. If it goes up, praise the Lord. That's why we look at that. He wants us to understand. We need to look at life. What are we doing a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? And I want to tell you, that sometimes we get into debt because we, we forget, we, I want this, and we can't afford it. I want to buy a new TV. Like Mike Cookman's got one that's like 100 inches wide. Or maybe 88 or 80. But it's big. I mean, you can see Missouri from there, from there on that. 
So what happens is that, but he could buy, he bought a TV he could afford. I re, see the point I'm trying to make. I can't compete with Mike Cook. Well, wait a minute. Let me think about this. I'm just teasing. The Lord is telling us to look ahead, and Mike has done that. I want to tell you, God is telling us to plan ahead. Be ready. Plan. And we need to do that. This church, we knew what Thursday was going to be like, and we started looking and doing, taking down everything and trying to prepare for everything. And then sometimes, even in planning, you don't have it all to do it right. So let me, let me say this to you this morning. Many people are waiting for someone to hand them something. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit to work and plan successfully. I don't know about you, but every one of us need to plan, and we need those plans to be directed by God. Now, sometimes people tell me, oh, that's not very spiritual that we would plan. We just plan God out of it. Mm, I don't know about that. I think there's a time to move, and I think there's a time to plan. And I think the problem of it is, is that people often, and then their own selves, if we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, I, I have a word for that. If you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, it's called being dumb. The Holy Spirit's not going to mislead you. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you every time right if you listen to him. He's going to tell you when to move, what to do. He's going to tell you when to plan. He's going to tell us when to fast and pray. And I've learned is that one of the things, there's sometimes that God is going to say, I need you to move right now. I need you to move. We need to act quickly. And other times he's going to say, be still. But if you're not in the word and you don't know, you're going to get lost in this. So he tells me, I, I, want, you to, I want you to plan me money. Can I just put something else out here? There's something that is more important than money. It's time. See, every one of us in this room have 168 hours a week. I don't care if it's Bill Gates or you. Everybody has the same amount of time. And we need to take that time and make a difference. And we need to take the money that we have and make a difference. Because, see, there, you, you can get more money. You just can't get more time. I want you to be faithful in that time as well as in money and helping people. Number five says, I'm a faithful and little. I'll be much can be trusted in more. Luke 16, 10. So every single area of your life is important. It means that I give, I use my talents, I use all this. You say, many people tell me, when I hit the jackpot, now I don't use the word lottery in the church, but if when I hit the jackpot, I, 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 they said, you know, I'm going to start serving God more. Or they say, if I hit the jackpot, I'm going to give more financially. So let me ask you a question. Are you serving God now? Only you can tell me that. Are you serving God with your tithe and your money now? Only you can say that. I'm not trying to upset you. I'm just trying to teach you the truth. Don't wait for something to happen. Do it now. So I want to say this. Number six, money is a spiritual test. Money is a spiritual test. In Luke 16, 11 through 12, it talks about the trustworthiness and untrust. God uses money to test us. It's like God uses money is like the acid test. In your life, more than anything else, you're going to be tested in the financial realms. So let me ask you a question. How you doing? How you doing? So here's what I want to show you. Now, um, I don't, I'll just use this as a, Zeb, let me use your wallet. Who's got a wallet? Let me borrow that thing. You need help, buddy. So, so I, I've, been think, I've been waiting to tell you this for two weeks. Do you know the most sensitive nerve in the human body is from your heart to your wallet? Most sensitive nerve. My dad taught me that. You say, Dad, uh, we, need, we need some money. And you can watch it. His arm would just start locking up. <laughs> it's the most sensitive nerve in your body, from your heart to the wallet. We're going to take a collection up for Zeb. Come here, Zeb. 
So what happens, we, the reason of it is, is that we're being tested. And God says, what if I ask you to give all the money? Last week you saw the video, I, I didn't want to show it again, of Barry's linebackers. I had four of my own linebackers. And, and sometimes people just so, they don't want to let go of their money. God is watching because he wants you to be responsible. And he's going to test you in just in a few moments. Lat, number seven says, money shows how much, who you love the most. It, it really does. It shows you who you love the most. And in that whole story, that love that you have is that you and I need to realize that that money that we have. So I, let me show you this. Um, uh, who has a checkbook? You left it at home. Okay. Hi. Huh? We, we don't. You do. Oh, I knew Miss Diane would come through for me. See, Diane and I are through the. Hand me both. Bring, bring me Diane's too. I need, I'm going to look at both of them. So, so what happened? Some of y'all younger people, I know you don't know what these are. Yeah, baby, as long as you got checks, you can keep writing. Now, now listen to me. I, 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 did I mix them up in there? You're going to have to make sure. I'm going to hand these back to you and just mix because I don't know who's the what. <laughs> so what happens is I could, I could, I ain't. But I could, I could look in here and tell you what they love the most. Now, I know both of these ladies. They love the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. And I know I could go to them and say, we need help in any of these. First one's up and check button right. I'm telling you, you can look at your bank account, your statement at, online. Is that what you said, Danita? Online. How do you do that? Never mind. What happens, we can tell about what happens, we know what you love. So, uh, you know, I like Epic up the street here. I do too. I can only go there once a year. But people like food, and they like clothes, and they like cars, and, and we like boats, and we like everything. But how much do we love God? And I need to come get these, and so I don't mix them up. I don't know, I don't know who's, who's what. Tell me, you need to help me out here. Okay, all right. Okay. So what happens in this is that we can look, and you can look, and you can say, God, I spent this. And you say, Barry, why are you making more? Listen to me. I'm going to tell you the point, most important part in just a minute. You do what you want to do. You love what you love. And you have to realize that God is looking. He knows what you love. He's trying to teach you this morning that you can't love two masters. You can't have two goals. You can only have one. And he's trying to teach us this morning that everything we need to do, if God gives you something, he then tells you to give it away. You couldn't give it away. You don't own it. It's not yours to begin with. He says, I got this money. I got this much money from, from my job. And the Lord says, I want you to give 10%. I want you to give to the church. You're not giving that money to me. Listen. You're not giving, you give it to the Lord, and he honors that and blesses that. So I want to say to you, I want to ask you a question. What do you love the most in your life? It's a simple question. This is really a simple thing. What do you love the most? Now, so I want to close this way. And the whole story of the attitude toward money is this. Best use of your money is to invest in getting people to heaven. That's what this is about, is investing your money. It should be the highest priority that you have, is using your money to build relationships, to help win people, to influence them to become a believer in Jesus Christ. So you take somebody out to lunch. You buy their lunch, and, and in that lunch, you get a chance to become friends with them and learn them. And then there's somebody here might be like me. You'll buy a Hallmark card, and you give it to it as a word of encouragement. You're investing in that people. Write this down. If you ever never learn anything else from me in your lifetime, this is what I want you to learn about money. Invest to invite. 
invest to invite. If you invest your money, then you can use that investment to invite them to Jesus Christ. And this whole thing, that's why your church does what it does. Listen, we are working. You buy a Christian book and you give it to somebody. You're investing in that person. And you're trying to lead them to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because one day you're going to be in heaven. And, and you're going to stand before the Lord and he's going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? How did you use it? And you say, well, I, I didn't use my money to, to help anybody get to heaven. I want you to get to heaven and there'll be people standing in the line. And you're walking up the line. And they'll go, hey, 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 hey. And all those people said, I'm here because of him or I'm here because of her. This is what I'm saying. I don't know about you, but there's people that you might have. Maybe there's someone in this group I'm sure I could name 20 people at least. Uh, uh, the ladies going on the ladies retreat someone paid for someone to go because they knew that person couldn't go because they wanted them to have an experience with Jesus that's what I'm talking about or there's somebody in here that took, that took the time and put the money so that one of our youth could go to summer camp and, the, and the, that kid comes back that young person comes back and they're so excited and, the, and they've given their life to Christ praise the Lord that that person said the Lord spoke to me, and I did that. I say to you this morning, the reason that you're giving is more about dollars and cents. It's bigger issues about the heart. I don't know this morning where you are with Christ. I don't know what the struggle in your life is about money. I just know this, that it's sometimes hard to give when you don't have. All I can tell you this morning is this. I can't outgive God. He, how he takes just a little amount and does great and wonderful things. But the Bible says it's my responsibility. It's in what's in my heart. I, I want to encourage you this morning that you would begin to realize that the giving is so important in your life. And the only way you're ever going to get past this is to get right with Jesus. When you get right with him, you're willing to sacrifice. So let's talk about it for a second. Little stuff down here in the front. And Needham went and got some. I went and got some so we could display it and make sure it's right. Because we wanted you to see how simple this is. So I'm going I'm I'm to I'm tug on your strings. Ma'am, this is, this, this, I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm just letting you have it with both barrels. You heard that baby scream a while ago? Let me tell you something. I tell parents who bring their children to church, don't, you leave that baby in here, it don't bother me one bit. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. If you have a baby, it don't bother me. No, it don't faze me a bit. I've been hearing that all my life. My twin brother used to whine all the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so here's the deal. So I'm just going to jerk, jerk your chain. What if you had a baby? You were in Western Carolina or in Abbeville. And your baby was hungry, and you didn't have anything to feed that baby. We're going to fix that problem, aren't we? Because we're going to find out we love people more than we do. I don't know about you, and don't get mad at me for some of you. will get mad at me, I'm sure. But some of us need to, we need to lose, we need to miss a meal or two. It wouldn't hurt us a bit. can't wait for the emails on Monday. <laughs> so let me, let me do this. Melanie, I want you to come up here. I want you to find me some little something in this, in this thing. Here's how we're going to close this morning. If you're here this morning and this is your first experience with me, let me tell you what you need to know. If you're waiting on me to do the same thing all every week, it don't happen here. 
I knew this morning when I got here and the Holy Spirit said, this is how I want you to close. I want you to put your stuff down. I want you to set your stuff aside. And I want you to, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning that you will come and I want whoever will. I'm not, I'm not about making people come to the altar. That is not my style. But I want to ask you this morning that you would come and just stand with me and let us pray that God will help these folks who cannot help themselves. For all those firemen who ran into the waters, all those Ian, all those people, them old good redneck boys that's bringing out the tractors and do stuff. I want us to pray for those folks. I want us to pray for those whose houses were completely washed away and don't know how they're going to pay. I want us to come and kneel and some stand and let us pray together that we will be people that will stand in the gap for them because it could be us next week. So whoever will, would you come and stand right here with me? Just come and stand. Let's pray for these people. Whether you're down here, whether you're back, we got to pray for these folks. These folks need help. And God is trying to move our church. He's testing our church. Just this afternoon, He's testing our church. right now we're coming as a body of believers Lord we just want to pray for our, these folks God I mean I just see the pictures and my heart just sinks for them I wonder how they're going to get through this but you told us this morning we have a test for our church we've been talking about money and talking about money but Lord the test is right now will we get off and go go to Walmart buy one thing or just one little thing maybe what we don't have but five dollars extra or 25 i don't know what it's going to be but lord it has to be above our tithe it's got to be an offering and god we're investing right now in those folks in all these areas today is greg will come and god we got to get him packed up he's got to leave at three o'clock so lord today for all days lord don't let us be late Help us stretch that budget. God, we're looking to you this morning. So, Lord, we love you. And if there's one person here this morning who doesn't know you, today is a day of salvation by simply asking Jesus to come in their heart. Lord, change us. Make us. Give us hope. And Lord, our church wants to be the first in line. It's your money, Lord. And you loan it to us. Help us to be good stewards. So, Lord, we praise your name. And all God's people say, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. Like, see you next week.